56 years ago, Russia, the northern Ural Mountains. A group of nine students of the Ural Polytechnic Institute embarked upon a difficult winter expedition to reach the Ototen Mountain. Their journey seemed to progress according to plan. However, on the seventh day of their trip, the weather conditions worsened. They lost their orientation and were forced to set up a camp on the slope of the mountain called Kolat Siakl. It was their last stop. Three weeks later in Yekaterinburg, when their families received no word of their success, the first rescue expeditions were sent. On February 25th, 1959, an abandoned encampment was found. The tent was torn down and covered with snow, with all the group's belongings left inside. Further examination revealed it was cut from inside out. The surrounding footprints indicated the crew had fled the tent. They were barefooted. This suggests a frantic escape, characteristic of people scared out of their wits. Two sets of prints led to a forested area down the slope. The rescue team found an improvised fireplace and two bodies. They were lying in but their underwear, with cuts and scratches to their limbs, suggesting they had tried to climb the tree in panic. What could terrify them so much? The next three bodies were found scattered a few hundred meters from the first discovery. One of them had suffered a fractured skull, this despite no evidence of a struggle. It took the spring thaw, two months later, to enable the rescue team to find the rest of the victims. The last four skiers were found buried in a thick layer of ice and snow. Their autopsies led to even more bizarre findings. All of the bodies had severe internal injuries caused by an undetermined force similar to that of a serious car accident. No external damage nor bruises were visible besides a tongue ripped from one victim's mouth and a strange orange skin color. Much speculation arose from these puzzling events. Such theories included attack from the local tribesmen from an avalanche or animals. Each theory, however, only served to create more questions. The truth behind this tragic course of events remains unexplained to this day. What really happened? Maybe the answer still waits to be discovered deep under the snow.
coming to me. thing I saw was a flash, an insufferable burning light, the pain ripping apart my body. I felt it tearing out of my soul. After a while, I was nobody, nothing. The light went out and I vanished into overwhelming darkness. I welcomed the end with delight. behind you. Have you ever tried to hold on to your humanity? When others convince you of being no more than a subject, an object, which they can bend to their will. When they told you that you were a monster that deserved punishment, and you could really not remember your sins. When they took away your loved ones, leaving you to rot in the dark. The problem is, that in their darkness, you have never been alone. I set out the moment I heard about the incident. I was in the area, so I reported to the unit myself to be automatically assigned to the case. I arrived at Vishai on February the 19th, 
a couple of days before the Institute's rescue group. While waiting for them, I started asking around to see if anyone from among the locals knew anything about the incident. One of them said he had a hunting cabin in the search region and knew the area very well. I decided to use him as a guide. When the rescue team had finally arrived, I explained to them what the unit's role was in this mission and that all discoveries or observations should be brought to my attention before anyone else's. We established priorities, checked the equipment and set off right away. It was not until February the 26th we found the tent that I believe belonged to the students. Initial findings show that the people in the tent cut its side wall and for some reason tried to escape from it in panic. The tracks in the snow led to a forest a kilometre and a half away. But the trail went cold after 500 metres and we had to carefully search the entire area. We had shivers crawling all over our bodies because of the atmosphere surrounding us. I was convinced that something more than just an accident had occurred here. I had the feeling we were dealing with something unnatural.
Processing the situation on and on, I realized I have no eyes. <laughs> Oh. 
sitting in room number 23, although sitting might not be the right word because we are running around trying to finish up packing anything else we could need. Uh, food cans, tools, essentially whatever we get our hands on. We want to be sure that we took everything we could possibly need. We're running out of time. Damn it, where did I put my belt? I'm sure we forgot about something. We're almost ready. We lost the knife. We're counting the money. We're leaving the room in a complete mess. So, we made it to the train station. We're singing all the songs we know and making up new ones as well. Everyone is so excited. Finally, at around 3 a.m., we go to bed. I wonder, what is awaiting us when we get there? What will we see? How far will we make it? I hear the rest of the group breathing peacefully and it's snowing outside. Covered the first bodies by the pine trees. A makeshift campfire suggested they tried to warm up. 
the bodies were only in underwear. I decided to thoroughly search the area between the tent and the tree line. I discovered the other bodies every few hundred meters apart. Their position indicated the victims attempted to return to the tent as fast as they could. This could mean that the threat was gone and the group decided to go back to the tent, or just the opposite. Someone or something appeared from the forest and forced its victims to run. At this point, it is difficult to determine what exactly happened. I have collected small samples from all bodies for further research at the unit's laboratory. I discussed this situation with the rest of the rescue team and afterwards they focused on the visual inspection of the tent and areas by the trees and I entered the forest. 